unlike in the previous session. Uh, uh, and, uh, and those who wanted to go home also have gone off, so uh, all who are here are going to be quite attentive, which is good. Uh, we are going to talk about transforming the economy through technology. And uh, when you say technology, uh, I want to emphasize that technology does not mean only IT or ICT. There is a bigger, broader depth to that word. And, uh, and as we go, you will see this. So uh, don't focus uh, your questions only on uh, technology or its ICT. Um, uh, before I actually go to introduce the speakers, there's some housekeeping work to be done. And that's, uh, there is a form or audience polling questionnaire uh, on your tables. Uh, the, can you please make sure that you do fill it as we go through the session and, and leave it on your table again, and that will be collected by the organizers uh, subsequently. Uh, so please, please look into that. Uh, and since I've got very limited time, and I've been told to stick to time, uh, we'll go through this fast. Uh, most of the panel here doesn't need any introduction, uh, but we have from that far corner, uh, Professor Samrajeeva, Rohan Samrajeeva, uh, founder of, uh, founding chair of Learn Asia, uh, and been here and been involved in policy and so many matters here in Sri Lanka. I got to know him as my first regulator. <laughs> so we had a good hate-friend relationship going on for a long time. Uh, and then uh, next to him is uh, Major General Munir, Munir uh, who has come from all the way from Bangladesh. He's representing Bcash, uh, Bangladesh, which is one of the mobile payment platforms in Bangladesh. Uh, from uh, there, we have Gihan Dias, VP uh, of uh, Millennium IT. Uh, Professor Ajit D. Alvis, uh, Project Director, Coordinating Secretariat for Science, Technology, and Innovation, in addition to many other things. Um, and then we have Linda. Alinda Swendamin, uh, founder, Academy of Design, and, uh, and then uh, Mr. Samantha Anatunga, managing director of CIC Holdings. So it's a, quite a diverse panel. Uh, we'll be talking about different topics, mostly towards innovation and technology and how that can transform our economy. So, uh, Professor, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, the conventional narrative is you got to have a problem and then you got to solve it. Uh, the, I wish I could take uh, all responsibility for the ideas here. I will take the responsibilities, but I benefited from a very uh, interesting group of commentators because this work was done in the context of a 2030 sustainable goals, uh, sustainable development goals for Sri Lanka exercise, which the president, president in, initiated this, this year. So I've had the benefit of uh, very interesting and useful comments from uh, a committee that I worked with. Uh, and it's from that that this invitation came that we present these ideas here. Um, but, of course, I can't blame them. If there's any problems with the presentation, they are all mine. So we do have a problem. I think you heard this in multiple ways. We, our export performance has gone down. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, in relation to our competitors, uh, I was doing some work, and I found this number to be quite interesting. In the sense that everybody talks, it's as though the problem is about FDI, about investment. But if you look at the, the sort of the increase in uh, uh, investment in uh, Vietnam and Sri Lanka between 2000 and 2014, basically it doubled. The issue was that Vietnam got uh, export-oriented FDI, while we got investment in non-tradables, real estate, telecom, and things of that nature, right? So they increased their exports almost 
by 9.5 times, and we basically doubled it. So that is our problem. And we have not been, now uh, even Ganeshan, uh, who spoke in the previous session, he was talking about services, but many people who talk about services don't really talk about one of the main forms of service exports that we engage in, which is we export labor. That's a form of service export, right? That's called mode four services exports. And if you look at it, we actually got 7.2 billion by exporting labor, and we got 7.1 billion from service exports, while what we got from goods export is 10 billion. And compared, I think somebody said we have diversified enough. I disagree. I think our goods exports have not diversified enough. Uh, so then the question is uh, market access. So Vietnam, which has been, I think Ganeshan showed you the numbers, how many trade agreements Vietnam has signed, uh, lots and lots of bilateral agreements, regional agreements, in order to get uh, that 9.5 times exports between 2000 and 2014. But in our case, we are still in process, let's say. Only thing that has been achieved is GSP+. Plus. And then, even if we get this market access, do, can we respond? Because our industries cannot expand fast, partly FDI problems, partly labor shortages. So, in this situation, the, the thesis is that we need to think in a different way. We can't think in the same old way that worked in the 70s, worked in the 80s, et cetera. We need to think in a different way and focus on innovation. So when we look at innovation, uh, I'm drawing from the Global Innovation Index, uh, which, is, which, re which pulls together 81 indicators. I've been very unhappy about uh, working on innovation because for the longest time people were saying innovation can be counted by only the number of patents issued or R&D expenditures and things like that. And I, I was very unhappy with that. But now finally we've got a, a composite index which looks at 81 factors and within that they basically Think about the inputs, that's how much you spend or what kind of things go into innovation and then what comes out. And they also look at something called in innovation efficiency. So the question is, where is Sri Lanka in that? Now I didn't think it was worth putting Sri Lanka and comparing Sri Lanka with all the countries in the world, with you know Switzerland and Korea and all that. I thought the only fair thing would be to look at us in relation to lower middle income countries. There's, I think, 29 countries in this category in the index. And I, am ho I'm s I hope you're looking to see where Sri Lanka is in the top 10, in any of the sub-indices, right? You can see Vietnam, it's at the top in three of the four indicators, that's the overall composite indicator, innovation output index, and definitely in the innovation efficiency ratio, because there you take output and divide by by uh, input, so uh, they are not spending, putting too much into input, um, and therefore their efficiency is very high. You can see Vietnam, you can see our neighbor India, you can't see Sri Lanka, can you? So last year, in 2016, Sri Lanka was there at number 10 in the, uh, in the efficiency category innovation efficiency category. Now we are not there. We are 43 places behind Vietnam and we are 30 places behind India. So we have a problem. If there's a problem, hopefully there's a solution as well. This, I'm not going to claim ownership for this term. I think many other people are talking about it. It is said that, uh, you know, if you think of something and many other people also thinking about it, it's time has come. So the idea here is, I'm not saying let's not do what was done before. Let's not do tax breaks. Let's not, I mean, I'm not saying any of those things. Do all those things. But in addition, just focus on how people can really innovate at the edge of research and the market.
at the market. Sri Lanka is a test bed. There are, I used to live in a place called Columbus, Ohio, in the United States. And one of the claims to fame of this mid-sized city was that it was seen as a place where companies would test various things. Some as mundane as a new hamburger, some as complex as new household technologies, smart homes, all kinds of things. It was seen as this was a, a, a typical, it was typical of the United States. So there was a lot of infrastructure to, to support this. So the idea here is that is it not possible for this compact country to leverage its position as a doctor of new ideas? After all, we are an island nation, and island nations have a, a, the tendency to, to be open to new ideas. But we have to provide a lot of uh, infrastructure for this. So to attract companies to come and do research here, to do design here, uh, to create the conditions for incubation of uh, new companies and to test products for the developing market. After all, I think you heard again, Asia is where the growth is going to be. And within Asia, the largest uh, unexploited markets would be around the Bay of Bengal. Of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world, six are around the Bay of Bengal not including Sri Lanka, but six are around the way of Bengal, right? So why not? Why not use this as a launch pad for people who want to, to supply uh, this market, to see what products work? This could also leverage from our strength in logistics. I think you know that Sri Lanka has a relative advantage with regard to logistics. So for that, what we need is a whole innovation ecosystem. And what I mean by innovation ecosystem is not, don't think of it simply from the supply side of scientists in white coats doing research in labs. That's needed too. That should go on. But we're, I'm talking more about this interface between real markets and new products. So for that, we'd have to have greater survey capability of doing market surveys. We'd have to really ramp up our capabilities in data analytics, qualitative research, various kinds of market research of testing whether things work. And we should do that conveniently, quickly, and at low cost. So what kind of actions would be necessary for this experiment nation to be created? So we need this to create this, this test bed. So we I'm not saying that the government should do any of these things. I think that what the government would have to do is to give, give greater flexibility in terms of cross-border movement of skilled personnel. Right? People will have to be able to come in and out. Right now, it's a complete pain in the uh, pain to get, get, <laughs> get a visa, a work visa into this country. Right? I mean, it's one of the most horrible, discretion-heavy uh, procedures that I can think of. But, bound it, you know, put minimum qualifications, put numerical limits, do whatever. But foreign firms will definitely be able to go through the BOI. And now with Duvindra at the head, I think BOI will become much more efficient in this regard. But what about those who don't have, I run a research organization, and I know what the pain is because I'm not BOI, right? So create that kind of flexibility. And of course, it has to be marketed. I'll come back to this marketing question. Because if these facilities are there, but the world doesn't know about it, it won't make any difference. So people have talked, I've been in the same uh, forum where people have talked about the tax incentives. I went around and talked to companies about whether they were using the tax incentives for R&D. You had all kinds of tax concessions that came in about four or five years ago. Many of them said, well, why do I need that? That's another layer of bureaucracy. I already have tax concessions, right? So let's study that. I'm not saying get rid of it, but let's study it and see whether it, it's working and how we can improve it and make it more effective. We need to develop the angel and venture financing. About six years ago when we started this uh, thinking in this area, there wasn't angel and, and venture financing in this country. Now there is. But compared to India, it's way below. So what are the things that we can, we can do to uh, to encourage more of that. Um, I 
have that particular suggestion about companies who have more 50 shareholders is actually not mine. I should have been careful with this one. I hope this is true, but I've been told that there are certain legal, legal limits uh, that hold back crowdfunding plat platforms in Sri Lanka. Uh, Trace Expert City, I think it was a wonderful idea. I think it's time to get it back and refocus it in terms of focusing on research and innovation, right? Not as just an office park, but a research and innovation park. And then take that basic idea and do it in other places. I've been spending a lot of time in Jaffna these days, and I think Jaffna would be a very good place to start. Uh, <clears throat> this is perhaps one of the most challenging things because I've talked to entrepreneurs, people trying to get patents in this country. It seems that if there's anything more difficult can get it than getting a work visa, it's getting, getting uh, some, some ideas patented in this country, at least from what I hear. So we really need a new model of uh, Cross-fertilization of ideas. I think the overall intellectual property model in the world isn't working very well. And if we can have some kind of edge here where we either have some innovative mechanisms or we have a fast track uh, implementation mechanism, uh, it will be very, very, very attractive for people to come and do innovation and testing and things of that nature here. Of course, mindsets. Mindsets are, of course, very difficult. But let's take the examples. Uh, for more than 10 years, uh, University of Morotu has had an innovation chair, uh, entrepreneurship at the focus. Uh, actually, some of the faculty there have complained to me that some of the students who get on this thing, they don't even pay them enough respect. Uh, they don't even, after working in companies or launching their companies, they don't uh, come and pay attention to courses and things of that nature. Let's study whatever that, that was done. And how can we tweak that? How can we improve that? Uh, and how can we spread it beyond, uh, un beyond one university to multiple uh, tertiary education entities? I'm not limiting myself to uh, entities which have the word university in them. Uh, maybe we have to go beyond uh, just the tertiary level. Because quite a lot of people say that by the time the exam system has done its work, uh, all the innovation and the creativity has been destroyed. So is it possible for the chamber or SLASCOM or somebody to try to develop some new kinds of schools uh, which focuses on innovation and tells us what kind of innovation, uh, that innovation is a valued thing in our country, not following the rules and memorizing the answers and writing the exams. Innovation-friendly ma messages in mass media. Uh, and then, of course, the most important thing that quite a number of uh, entrepreneurs who looked at the draft document told me is that people still think of Sri Lanka as a relevant market. And if you look at Sri Lanka, this is the size of greater Mumbai. This is the greater Delhi area. In any given day, 20 million people get on the Mumbai public transport system. Any given day, right? So that means that there's more people moving around uh, Greater Mumbai than here, right? Just the public transit system handles 20 million. So how are we going to, to think in those small terms? You need to think of the Bay of Bengal. You need to think of Bangladesh. You need to think of the Indian market. You need to think of even Maldives, for God's sake. Uh, but I do. I mean, I've been impressed uh, at the Fiji airport. I remember I heard some singular... And I said, what are you doing here? To find there were these guys who were selling IT systems in Fiji. And then the minister tells me, oh, look at all these entrepreneurs that we got in, in, in our country from Sri Lanka. So it's not like we are not thinking big, but do enough of us think big uh, for the, and think in terms of a larger market than Sri Lanka. So if you think of position Sri Lanka as a place which is about piloting, about testing, about proving, and then you think bigger. So uh, I think that would be the really interesting part. And of course, our problem in our country is not the lack of, it's not ideas, it's not about policies, it's about implementation. So this kind of thing is necessarily cuts across multiple ministries. Because this is not about IT or digital 
infrastructure, anything like that. This is about innovation in general, right? Um, and I've been, I've been told that for every subject in Sri Lanka, every topic, every subject, there is a ministry. And I say, can you look at what my organization, a research organization does, and tell me which ministry covers what I do? And the answer is they can't. So uh, is it possible to do that with the turf safeguarding attitudes that we have? We have some cross-cutting entities, such as the BOI, but uh, BOI isn't about innovation, it's about investment. So how can we, how can we anchor this innovation story uh, without somebody breaking the, the, the silos? It'll have to, to mobilize investment. Now that's where the BOI and the EDB come in. It has to uh, mobilize investment. I'm not saying spend any more government money money that the government, does, the government doesn't have. So what we need is, we need facts on the ground. I think the days when we could just talk about our dreams and talk about our plans are gone. Nobody believes us anymore. I think we need facts on the ground. I still remember, you know, when we were trying to build up the BPO industry in Sri Lanka, one of the key points we said is enough talk. We need one big building on next to a big next to a road that everybody can see, and that was the value of that HSBC building, was that people could see that, and that was facts on the ground. There's a war going on, but BPO can be done, and a global company like HSBC has chosen to establish a BPO operation in Sri Lanka. That did more than all the words that we could have used. So we need to do facts on the ground. We need to showcase the startups, and we really need to focus on the indicators that will drive up our performance. Because there's no point in doing these kinds of things without having the target of getting in the top 10. I'm not saying we can get to the top. I'm not saying that we can beat Vietnam. But at least in the lower middle income category, we need to be in the top 10. So that means we look at the 81 indicators that they're using. We target the ones that we are going to improve on. And all this will also have to be communicated. We need the BOI, we need the EDB, we need a large number of, and of course the private sector, to tell this story to the world. That Sri Lanka is open for business. That we are going to be the test bed of Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Samrajeeva. Uh, how we will continue from here is that I will actually pose some questions to the panel first, uh, creating uh, uh, overall uh, discussion, and then I would like if you could continue to send questions that we could take up afterwards. Uh, actually, the next uh, question I would like to post is to Professor Ajit Dialvis. I want to you to actually take up what uh, Professor Samrajeeva said. Uh, because you, you're coming from the Coordinating Secretariat for Science, Technology, and Innovation uh, that was set up in February 2013. So you have a, quite a lot of experience now trying to coordinate a lot of activity, including innovation across ministries, across uh, uh, many organizations. So um, Prof, Professor Samuel, you have touched on something very interesting in the innovation ecosystem. Do you think we already have something like that here? Right? And if, you, if, if you do, do you think we need to reinvent it, or is it, is it good enough? And there's also one more thing that I would like to challenge you or ask you. He also sp spoke about the implementation, and he, he spoke about a supra-ministerial task force. Do such things work? What is your opinion? What is uh, coming from the government sector? I would like you to, 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 to elaborate on, on that. First of all, um, Professor Samaraji mentioned something very interesting, and I think as Sri Lankans we should take up, which is the current position of Sri Lanka in the GII, which actually Sri Lanka has been slipping, right? Um, it's not something that we should be proud of. It's an index that measures the innovation capability, capacity, and you can see countries as small as Switzerland is consistently on the top, and countries as small as Singapore is consistently on the top, right? Because they have set and they have done, they have produced, uh, technically innovated. Uh, it's doable, and I don't think our aspiration should be to in this uh, low-middle-income 10, 
we should try to be better. We are actually one of the best in terms of the efficiency of inputs to output conversion at some time back. Uh, it's there in a few years back. Uh, we have now slipped even from that top 10 in that uh, it's, uh, so it's a sad situation. But we took this into our hearts at the Costi at one point when we started, but we started Sri Lanka Innovation uh, Index. We put the first pillar out, that is a governance pillar. The reason for putting that is beyond our control, uh, right? And the host of other organizations and the rest can work on it. But we thought we will take on the, um, the S&T infrastructure, uh, the rest of the stuff that's enabled the innovation to take place. And we've kind of identified the Sri Lanka Innovation Index, what we called as Slindex. And then also we went down to Provincial Innovation Index doing that. Because if you look at, we are not making use of what we have. Uh, answering your question of whether do we have an ecosystem. Yes, it's disconnected, it's disjoint. I mean, if you take, how many of us know that there are 49 research institutes under 18 line ministries. I'm referring to the current gazetted, uh, the allocation. Uh, that's pretty dynamic distribution because it changes. But nevertheless, that's what we have, 49 research institutes of varied sizes and forms within 18 ministries. And the university system, 17 in the public university system, under three ministries. So we're talking about around 66 institutes that are capable of R&D and being part of the innovation process under 20 line ministries. Which means there can be duplication. And as a country, we spend 0.1% of the GDP on R&D. We are way below the, even the lowest, um, I mean, LDCs. Uh, in the percentage income that they spend on R&D. Of course, some can argue with the issue should not be doing R&D and that's different, but the point is these are yardsticks, the measurements that are commonly applied, so I may as well stick to that for the moment, but we are doing 0.1%. So we res uh, the recommended is 1%. So you're talking about a tenfold increase even to reach what is called the normal for an LDC. And anywhere, 1% R&D on a GDP is a recommended value, so we are way below. So we have a very small input spread across in the public system, there's a large number of institutes and places. That's, that's considered a problem, but certainly you need people to work on uh, and then ensuring that the amount of money that you spend actually gets some decent deliverables. That's how, I suppose, is the efficiency. So you need coordination. So we do have a system, we have a uh, ecosystem, which is not connected. Uh, to support that again, we do have, say, like uh, the ICT, we have nanosolars right across Sri Lanka around the 200 plus. Then our own ministry, we have Vidata centers, which is bringing science to the rural uh, the communities, the extension service almost. We have about 300 nearly uh, across Sri Lanka. But we will find Nanasala is not talking to Vidata, no Vidata to Nanasala, because they are operating in different compartments, right? And that's, but resources are spread thin, but when you do not make use of the synergy, it's an unfortunate situation. We believe strongly there's an important for coordination. And um, whenever you ask a question, we normally come out and say in groupings, okay, one of our problems is lack of coordination. But then as coordinators, we found coordinators are really hated, right? You try to coordinate, it's not one of those, um, the, um, the jobs that you like to be in sometimes. Uh, you see the value of it, but um, it's not really appreciated but we need to accept it and we need to do it because we cannot change the system that we talk about in 66 and so on. Um, so I, I, my quick answer now in that is yes, we have it, but we need to understand it because private sector doesn't understand what the public sector offers and perhaps public sector may not exactly understand what the private sector needs, but that needs to be bridging by communication. We need to do that. Let's make use of the resources that we have and also a planned approach to increasing that resource base, that's what we are giving. Uh, pub private sector putting in R&D is much less uh, than the government. So coordination is essential, but the Supra Ministry, to me, what I see is now from a costly personal point of view, the government has taken a decision to make it an coordinating authority for science, technology and innovation. Let's hope that to materialize in time to come, the cabinet has accepted it. Uh, it's moving through the legal draftman. So I'm not sure about Supra Ministry real, but at least you need somebody uh, who understand what's going on and do a facilitating role. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's move to the other panelists and, and look at a few um, uh, 
experiences in more in the private sector. And uh, actually, uh, I would like to um, direct this to uh, uh, General um, uh, Major General Mon Monirol uh, from Bcash. Uh, we like to, you know, Bcash was set up uh, uh, to to take mobile money across in the in the Bangladesh, uh, across to everybody in Bangladesh, and uh, it has been now operating for a few years. So I would like to get your experience. You know, has Bcash been able to penetrate into the low income masses in Bangladesh, uh, such that it created a positive impact? Uh, and if so, can you sort of share your experience and the challenges that you faced? Because there's uh, something uh, quite new. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> First of all, uh, financial inclusion was uh, one of the important agents uh, of Bangladesh government. Uh, because if we looked at the statistics, we found out that only 15% of adult population in Bangladesh had a formal banking account, whereas we have a high penetration of mobile phones. About 70% of our adult population possess a cell phone. And the idea of bridging the gap with the help of this technological device was basically the driving force for getting into MFS business. Uh, the MFS started its journey in Kenya uh, with m in 2007. And the one that established Bikash actually carried out his research for about four years. He had visited Kenya to understand how it operates, and then came back and spoke to a few of the other people, especially the regulator, that's the central bank. The central bank, knowing that this would be actually dealing with financial service, decided that this should be a bank-led model. So our one is a bank-led model. Obviously, the central bank wanted a bank to be partnered if any other investor was interested to get into this business. So first, it was money in motion, LLC, a US-based uh, entrepreneurship company. They partnered with Bragg Bank BRAC, of course, is the largest NGO in the world that you possibly know, and they have a bank. So it was the majority share went to Bragg Bank, and it was Money in Motion who actually was the minority shareholder, and through that, the inception of Bikash took place in 2010. The central bank issued 28 licenses to 28 banks, but 17 came into operation, because it was something little different. It was a subsidiary, not one particular wing or a product of the bank. So it has one single focus, that was to provide MFS to the lower segment of economic pyramid. That means the poorer people who did not have access to formal banking. Because you know, uh, a large portion of our country, obviously, uh, are villages. Uh, 68,000 villages in Bangladesh. So the banks with brick and mortar arrangement and the manpower deployed cannot have their branches to actually offer services to these people. The other reason was that these people do not actually have large ticket size, which the banks look for. Obviously, the banks were not interested to serve uh, with people coming with maybe 1,000 BTT, which is close to about 2,000 Sri Lankan rupees. So. After Bikash started his journey in providing mobile financial service, in 2013, IFC of World Bank became an equity partner. And in 2014, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation also invested into the company. Now, the things were very simple. The banks or the financial institutions or the subsidiary was to provide the service. The MNOs are to provide the gateway to get people connected, and the customers use their personal cell phone with a SIM to open an account and operate. Now, after about six years, where do we stand? 
We have 28 million registered customers. We conduct 4.9 million transactions per day through an agent network of 176,000 agents. And a study of Dhaka University suggests that 90, sorry, 87 percent of the rickshaw pullers of Dhaka send their money home through Bikash. And the volume that we transact on a regular basis is $100 million, which is equivalent to 8.3 billion Taka, or maybe 15 billion Sri Lankan rupees. So that's a huge amount of money that we deal. We say that actually we deal with anchovies, the small fishes, the big fish, would always go to the bank, and bankers are very much interested. But look at the kind of accumulated money that we deal. And there is always a float. And what happens with that? We actually have entire of the cash deposited in banks. Unless that is done, equivalent amount of B cash or E money is not delivered. So the banks hold that money which is a large sum of money. And obviously you know that as entrepreneurs you know you can then use that money for making hospitals, factories, or whatever. So that's how Bikash has contributed to the economy of Bangladesh. Uh, there is a significant growth in our GDP and we think it should range between five to six percent of our contribution in the sense of only providing the service, but it's about the money that our common people is to keep under the mattress, now have put into their personal accounts, and that particular total amount is in the banks. We operate with support of 14 banks. It was initially only Bragg Bank, and the central bank realizing that Bragg Bank branches are not so many, has allowed us to partner with any banks, and so far we have had done with 14 banks. They do our cash management. So one thing that needs to be understood that for any amount of e-money that needs to be taken out of the bank, equal amount of cash money must be deposited. So it is in any point in time is equal. Cash money equal to the e-money circulated in the market. We are thinking of further innovation bringing in more products so that our customers get more interest in using the MFS. And obviously, it's all about technological advancement. We are thinking of apps which would allow our semi-literate or half-literate people to navigate through and conduct transaction. This is very affordable. The lowest that is charged is in Bangladesh, and that's the study of the sea gap. It's very convenient because we have the network at walking distance anywhere in Bangladesh. And then, of course, it is very fast. Every transaction can be done within 90 seconds, anywhere within Bangladesh. And it is through a secure means because every transaction is recorded in the data, and the recipient and the sender is given a SMS that shows the current balance sheet of that particular transaction. Uh, hopefully, in future, uh, in next six months to one year, we would turn out to be the largest MFS in the world. Thank you all. Thank you. Linda. Uh, you have directly been involved using digital technology in disrupting a traditional retail model uh, in this highly competitive garment industry and uh, through your fashion market.lk. That's what I want to talk about. Uh, and not have you only made a mark here, uh, you have actually broken into the $35 billion in, uh, garment sector in India, the fashion sector in India, which is amazing. 
would you like to talk something about that to us and tell us something about your experience, learnings, as well as what you think the government can do in terms of supporting, uh, you know, people like you taking it forward out to the world? Yes, so um, <clears throat> our most recent uh, experience has come from uh, the digital space, really, and uh, leveraging online. Uh, so what we've been, uh, what really we've been able to do uh, is use this whole online and digital space uh, to really own our own retail. Now, Sri Lanka is a really small country. Uh, so right from the beginning, uh, it's been like we've got to go global. We've got to own a market outside. So uh, our most recent success, like uh, Dumindra shared, is uh, with fashionmarket.lk, where we've been really able to take a total product from a village in Sri Lanka right to a in global consumer. So uh, the reason now, I mean, the most exciting uh, times right now uh, is the potential of digital uh, and that you can really go right to an in consumer with what you have. Uh, but, but actually, we wouldn't have been able to take this journey uh, if we didn't have an authentic product in the first place. So what this whole uh, digital and online space is also allowing you to do, as much as it's allowing you to go directly to the consumer, you've got to also have an authentic product to take there. So we've been a bit fortunate because, uh, I, mean, I mean, I'm a hardcore Sri Lankan entrepreneur, uh, and over the last 10 to 10 years or so, uh, we've been able to create a design sector in Sri Lanka that's worked for our own country. So right from the beginning, uh, from you know, launching Sri Lanka's first design uh, institute, uh, college, uh, to creating our own design talent, uh, that would actually look at what our country had to offer. I mean, now this model is obviously applicable across South Asia. So if you looked at uh, what we have at our doorstep, it's uh, really a great apparel industry. Uh, then we have uh, grassroots level cottage industries. Uh, so it was really not about designing some silly stuff, you know, doing some pretty sketches, but actually creating the talent that would take this, uh, uh, you know, manufacturing industries we had uh, and create a global product out of it. So that's the journey that we've been on the last 10 years. And over the last two years, we've used digital uh, to take it global and actually commercialize the product. Uh, now to answer your question to me as to what the government can really do, uh, is I think one is uh, our journey over the next two years is really we believe that Sri Lanka can play a role uh, in being the South Asian design innovation hub. And just a couple of days ago, we launched a project called the Colombo Innovation Tower, uh, which is a massive project. Uh, and again, not alone, but working with all these industries, like the apparel industry, who really use design innovation, and all of their buyers are asking for it now. Uh, so really uh, collaborating with everyone, uh, and being, uh, you, know, really, uh, you know, really the government working really with the private sector in owning that own space, and making a declaration, a declaration and saying, Sri Lanka can actually, you know, be South Asia's design and innovation hub. We get visits from Bangladesh to India to everyone, uh, you know, asking uh, for design innovation to come into those countries. So really owning that space, substantiating our position, and even creating a cell within the government. Uh, then the other is engaging, you know, get the diplomatic community involved, right? Uh, we are not the first to do this. Uh, Britain has something called uh, Creative Britain, uh, which is the creative industries. Uh, they did a roadmap. Uh, and they really tie it into, uh, you know, economic benefit. They really say Britain's, uh, you know, creative industries, and they show uh, how the creative industries contributes to wealth generation, economic development, and all of that. Singapore's gone the same journey. Uh, the Dutch uh, were the first to use design uh, innovation uh, and take it across the industry. So we have a lot. So second task for the government is create the cell, engage all these diplomatic communities who are waiting to do that. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, finally is that cell should service our own industries and should also service South Asia. Uh, and, uh, and I'm making this statement with a lot of responsibility that we do have a following from South Asia asking for this. I mean, like East Asia has done or the Middle Eastern market. Imagine what a powerful force we can be out of South Asia. Across all our countries, we have amazing cottage industries. We have high-tech manufacturing. You know, this, uh, if we have the right kind of design which we've created, in a very responsible way, we can be such a powerful force and we can contribute globally in a big way. And Sri Lanka can be leading that agenda. So that's where I see our journey over the next few years and I hope the government, we, I mean, to collaborate with the government more. Uh, and finally, actually, uh, you know, people think digital 
uh, and uh, you know the digital economy, the creative economy are things out there. They're not, they're part of today. I mean, everybody is talking about the millennial. Uh, you know, we are currently about to you know, have the Z generation come in. They are digital natives, so it's not something out there. You know, it's something, it is going to be what we can leverage, especially for a small country like ours to go global. We need to leverage digital. Uh, and uh, we need to live in that space. If you can't live in that space, you need to surround uh, yourself with the age category that can live in that space uh, and leverage them. Uh, so this digital and creative economy go hand in hand. Uh, and I believe for a small country like us, you know, really, at least in our sector, which contributes to a, a lot to the economy and to service all our industries and really uh, take that journey would be the space the government needs to go, I believe. Thank you, Linda. Um, now, from garments to agriculture, uh, I'd like to direct this to Mr. Samantha Ranatunga. Um, CIC has been involved in the agriculture and livestock sector since its inception, uh, initially with products and solutions, and then with uh, subsequently venturing into the production and retail. Uh, I would like to hear your thoughts on how you have used technology uh, to play a bigger role in the agribusiness and the production and the retail of, uh, of, uh, at CIC, and how this could be rolled out on an inclusive manner, even into the small sector, the small farmers and the, the, the small sector of agriculture here in Sri Lanka. Thank you, Duminda. I think uh, take agriculture, I think, in any economic forum, uh, agriculture is a uh, 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 the bad boy of the forum because when you take the Sri Lankan GDP, uh, we contribute about 10%. Agriculture contributes 10% to the GDP, but employing nearly about 30% of the Sri Lankan people. So I think this is where I think our first conundrum lies. Uh, the, prop the agriculture automatically becomes an item of political interest because of the large population it impacts and uh, and it keeps and if you have people with issues and agriculture has kept people in issues that creates a living and a purpose for the politicians so i think this is something we have to take it we have to take it into a different forum and try to see whether we can find answers in a, a different platform and i think in the, in the way in that way, the fact that we are looking at technology, I think is an eye-opener. And I'm in very, I was very encouraged when I got this question from uh, Duminda. Uh, if we take a look at, uh, I think, agriculture has basically been, I think, the bane of, uh, bane of technology. Because if you take our agriculture, which we have as export agriculture, TV celebrated 150 years. I think we showed and showcased a fair amount of history. I think the amount of technology that it's also show, showed the paucity of the amount of technology that has been there, that is there in the industry. If you take paddy, paddy, it has been the it has been the same because we still perpetuate the the traditional forms of agriculture, and we have gone on. But I think this is has caused till about the last 20 years this has been the way it has been the we have we have the way we have continued and i think the fact that we have an exodus of people especially the youth leaving agriculture i think has made people to just uh, step back and look at this issue in a different way i think this is where we have now seen the forays into technology where I think looking at applying of fertilizer, applying of, uh, uh, applying of weather, control con with weather control conditions, these are some aspects which I think we had shunned aside. We have said that these are not things that were needed, were required. But we have seen in agriculture the last three seasons have been disasters. Now we see a renewed interest in covered agriculture, where we are trying to control the climate that we have around. This was done earlier in the very developed countries, but now we see it as a business model, even not at the most high, high, high level of computerized control, but even having 
at least covered agriculture, where we put a polythene sheet and put a, a PVC frame and try to cover and keep the sunshine out, uh, is, is now being practiced uh, in, in, in a lot of areas which, which was never thought of as it was possible. So I think the fact that we have had issues of the weather, kids who are thinking differently, who are adapting technology, who through uh, various forms are getting, getting influenced, we have, so we have seen that how this has brought in uh, some, some of the new ideas. And so as a company, we have basically gone, uh, we, have, we have gone into, uh, uh, into livestock, which is basically again covered livestock where we do not allow grazing. I think this is again, the, most of the modern companies it has happened. We have gone into, uh, into crop, which is basically undercover and with weather control. Uh, where the wageries of the weather is impacting on the minimal basis, and which this also has found much better and more lucrative markets. Uh, and also we have seen how in, in the applying, of, uh, applying of fertilizer or pesticides, more scientific methods where uh, soil analysis and testing is being done. I think the fact that the environmental pushback, which the companies have had in the recent past, has helped us to also rethink our strategy in some of the inputs and the way that we use inputs. So these have meant that the technology, not in the maybe in the digital space right now, but in the, in the normal scientific space, we are, there is much more technology that is being used. In the digital space, I think we still lack. We are way behind uh, countries like India, Indonesia, Malaysia, where I think there are a lot of farmers which are using uh, virtual markets, virtual weather stations, uh, and this, this type of aspect is, is we are still very new in, is new in Sri Lanka. There are some initiatives which are currently being done by, I know our company and some of our uh, other agriculture companies with some of the neighboring mobile operators. We are involved in it. But I think this is a journey which has started maybe a little bit, a little bit too late in the day, but I think this is a journey which we must go. If we need to keep the future generations in agriculture, we have to introduce more technology. So I, I, I think we have started the journey, but I'm still not sure whether if we have started it too late. Because the amount of people who have abandoned agriculture is fairly phenomenal. And still, when you go to, when you go to the rural areas, it's still the youth are away, but it's the parents who are basically still in the fields now, which is a disturbing sign. How do we take this more popular, how do we take technology to the, to the farming communities? I think the government has had many efforts, and as Professor Alvis said, the collaborative nature uh, is, is a challenge. Government has always, this has its way as uh, the people, the private sector and the farmers go in their own individual way, the government goes its individual way. The collaborative nature, I think, has to be brought in to see how we can work together. And the amount of platforms that we create where the public and the private sector, along with the individual farmers, could interact together and, and pass technology to one another and adapt technologies and strengthen each other, I think is the only way that we can make this uh, a viable situation where that our GDP can be contributed greater by agriculture and that we can get out of the trap of the poverty ag in agriculture, which will make it something which is more lucrative for the nation's development. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. So from agriculture, now we head to IT. Though I said technology is not only IT. Uh, Gihan, uh, Millennium, is probably one of the more well-known examples of Sri Lankan, uh, for Sri Lankan company achieving global success, uh, especially via technological innovation. How can we replicate the factors behind Millennium's success uh, to create a more success, you know, lot more success stories? And uh, how, how do you think that this will transform our economy? So, can I, I have to give you a two-part answer. So let me, let me talk about the first part, which is about how you could potentially replicate Millennium success. And if you look at the factors behind Millennium success, uh, actually a lot of it echoes really what, what Professor uh, Ron was saying earlier, essentially. If you look at 
how Millennium made it big. Millennium's built on a few things. One is incredible talent, right? So essentially, we've always made it a point to hire the best talent, and that's obviously a replicatable function. Certainly, we can obviously invest more in producing more graduates, more IT graduates. That's an, an easy thing to do. Um, leveraging capital. So in the early days of Millennium, certainly a lot of angel funding, a lot of VC funding, difficult 20 years ago, easier now. If you create that ecosystem, certainly we can create more startups and a higher probability of some of them will go global. The going global part, I think, is, if you're on my view, the real differentiator. Uh, and Millennium benefited from having a visionary founder, an unusually visionary founder, uh, who's also an incredible salesman, actually, so Tony Wiedersinger, who's in town these days. Um, and he, you know, so he took what would have been a, essentially he took a very global view, a very long-term view, and pushed a fairly talented set of young chaps to do, shall we say, great things. The third one, harder to replicate, to be fair. Um, but again, I suppose it's a numbers game. If you get more and more startups, there's a higher you know, probability you'll see more of those. So that's the, that's the, the millennium part, shall we say. Um, I have a slightly different angle to this, though. So if you're talking about transforming the economy, so let's say we do this. Let's say we do encourage VC, uh, angel funding. We, we do. We should obviously uh, expand IT education. Um, let's say we are successful and we replicate millennium. We have 10 millenniums in 10 years' time. That would be a fabulous outcome. That would be a transformative outcome for the IT industry. Would it transform the economy? Maybe not. A millennium employs 700 people. 10 millennium, 7,000 people. Call it 10,000 with a, you know, a little bit of expansion. Ten, you know, if we're talking about transforming the economy, I suppose we should be talking about hundreds of thousands, transforming millions of people's lives. So I think, certainly, when you talk about innovation, there's sort of two angles. One angle is the, in my view at least, the invention of technology. Um, R&D and incubating startups and creating new technology. The millenniums of this world, not just millenniums, Slintech. You know, there's a number of uh, examples of you know, great Sri Lankan companies inventing technology and, and achieving success. But I think if you really want, in my personal opinion, if you want scale and you want to transform the economy through technology, we have to think also about the application of technology, uh, of existing technology. I and mean, we were talking about this earlier, right? So the, the simplest example is if you take the, the computing revolution, personal computers, mobile computers, etc. it's been you know, certainly 40 years uh, of computing. But if you walk into, if you look at the state sector, country's largest employer, you walk into a police station, not a lot of computers there. I mean, typewriter is the most advanced thing you see in a, in a police station. You walk into a post office, not a lot of computers there. I mean, in general, that, you know, that, that is a huge opportunity with very basic technology to increase, to I mean, radically increase productivity. And I think there's value in thinking about how we can do that, how we can promote that, how, to be frank, the state, I suppose, can incentivize, possibly subsidize, possibly sponsor, promote the adoption of technology and leverage that uh, and drive productivity. And I think that's how you really get scale and you really get transformative. Um, I'll stop there. I have other anecdotes, but I'll, I'll stop there for the moment. Thank you, Gihan. Uh, I think uh, we are moving into question and answer. I have got a few uh, here. I'll start, to be fair, with, with the first question that I got. Uh, and it's, it's open to anyone here, so we all can talk. Um, it's uh, digitization and automation will make some jobs obsolete. Is there a plan to amend the rigid labor laws? If not, how can companies get the maximum benefit? Anybody here? Yes. <laughs> well, when the uh, BPO industry was coming, uh, that was around 2002, 2003, and we were trying to create this industry. This issue came up because we have laws in this country which say women cannot be employed at night. Uh, I didn't think this was the highest priority for, for us because I really didn't want to get this, you know, get Sri Lanka into this, uh, what do you call it, uh, out calling the sort of the 
worst aspects of BPO sector. Uh, we felt that we needed to go for a higher segment. But you know, ideally, uh, so we didn't, uh, we didn't really push that. We didn't have much time either. Uh, we didn't really push that. That was, uh, I, but I do think, you know, I mean, what is this logic? That somehow women can't buy alcohol in this country? I don't know whether you know that. There's a law on the books which says a woman cannot buy alcohol. And women cannot work at night. I mean, what kind of patronizing attitude is this? These are all British laws, by the way, right? Not ours. So I, I honestly think these things should be removed. But on the other hand, and I think we should have the flexibility. You want to put safeguards, let's talk about safety in the buses. Right? Our buses are like hell for women. Right? Let's talk about real problems, not unreal problems. And the BPO industry actually is running massive transportation fleets, as far as I can figure out. And, you know, I mean, if there's some safety issues there, we could focus on that and solve that problem. But I do think we need to look at all our laws and try to, try to change them. But uh, I'm just admitting that that wasn't the highest priority when I was in government. Yeah. My area so much, yeah, but the, the question also is sort of directed towards this point where uh, automation will make some jobs redundant. Of course. And then, you know, how, how uh, in a country like us, in a developing country like the, us, uh, how could the government more sort of, you know, help us in making sure that it does not create a conflict as we know what's happening outside, you know. So that's then. There is, as I understand, there's no easy answer. I think we had asked this question five years ago. The, the pat response from somebody on the panel would have been, it's fine, retraining, we'll sort it all out, we'll retrain everybody and it'll be okay. Clearly, the pace of automation is going to outpace the retraining ability. We get that. If you want my personal opinion about the risks here, I think they're less. I think the, if, you, if you look at sort of the cost of the technologies we're talking about, I don't think in the, near, in the immediate near term we're necessarily going to have the kind of redundancy we're talking about, say, in the US with truck drivers, for example. I would like to think. Again, I can't say I'm, I'm an expert, but I think it's fair to say it's a very real problem that we need to think about. There's no pat answer. Retraining is the obvious answer. Retraining is, I think everybody would accept, much more difficult than, uh, than anybody realizes. And I'm sure uh, Samantha would probably comment on, if you, if you talk about automation in agriculture, the, the practicality of retraining somebody who's been farming his whole life. Not that straightforward. I, I, I actually, I, I can't really give you a definitive answer. It's, something, it's a policy that we need to think about. I don't think anybody in the world has really figured it out right now. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I was reading an interesting article which basically was focusing on this whole thing where one day even uh, buses would be driven by the bus itself, you know, sure. and, and we would hardly need people to uh, do the jobs. And then what would the people do? You know, and this article was all talking about how people would be playing games <laughs> and making money after playing games. You know, I think it's a question that really many have not looked at. Uh, and, and definitely, yes, you know, there's a question about uh, redundancy. But uh, I think on one side, or though there's automation, people cannot be taken out completely. Uh, there is always a need. Professor, yeah, yeah uh, I mean the Indian uh, software industry is beginning to see some effects, right? There has been job loss in that. But I think uh, the issue is what is our selling proposition here, in the, particularly in the IT and IT enabled services? That has not been the sort of mundane, uh, you know, quality check software testing kind of stuff. So I think it's going to be, as you said, it's going to be less of a problem here. And in addition, I think, you know, I mean, we need to be a little cautious about some of these scare tactics stories that are coming. Uh, when uh, in the telecom industry, you know, we had large numbers of people, women in particular, who used to operate switchboards. And there was all this concern that, you know, there would be some incredible problem uh, if the switchboards were eliminated by the automatic exchanges. And then the opposite of it is that if you had switchboards for the current usage of telecommunications, we would have to have more than half the population of each country operating switchboards. So let's take this periodic scare stories with a grain of salt. Uh, OK, let's move on. And that's quite an uh, interesting question. And I'd like to put to the panel, most probably, Professor Ajit, you should be able to answer this or help. Uh, what hope do we have in legal framework getting uplifted to safeguard innovation and design safe? 
uh, with better IP laws and cross-border IP protection for Lankan innovation? There is an ongoing program with the National Intellectual Property Office and the World Intellectual Property Office actually supporting Sri Lanka has, I think it's a very good platform to pass this idea. That's what is happening. Uh, there's a 10-point action plan with WIPO NIPO and uh, with the Sri Lankan uh, uh, universities, research institutes, and it's open to public-private, uh, participating in to improve what's called enabling Sri Lankan IP infrastructure uh, environment. So there's a lot of activity that is scheduled to happen. Uh, Starting from uh, Sri Lanka, I, 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 I do see the, uh, what Professor Amarajiva put in as, we do have a weak IP system concept. There's a strong perception that we are very poor in this regard. But I would say it is more so not the lack of rules and regulation, but more so the implementation. And how much we value that in our day-to-day -day decision making, right? Most of, if you ask from even up to the blue chips, uh, you go and ask what is, uh, what is your patent portfolio, what's your value uh, on the intangible assets of your organization. Such, such discussions do not come in. We are much more on the asset base, what we can see, what's immovable. Um, uh, so IP, the intangible assets, the knowledge-based concepts, is not there in our decision-making process. We need to put that in. I mean, remember, even if you take United States, of, of course I'm taking the number one economy, uh, but 33% uh, plus of the GDP comes from, not from, um, uh, it's come from intangible assets, right? The trademarks, the copyrights, the pay, intellectual property, etc. So there's a huge um, lesson that we can take because from our side, we do not have the numbers to compete in some of these other markets that are uh, emerging. We don't have the billions, we don't have the, even the lakhs or the millions. But what we should understand is what we lack in numbers, we should have in terms of quality and um, then the ability. We must leverage on the quality and the ability. Technically, we talk about uh, high literate nation, literacy, I mean, lit literacy very high, uh, but you ask the question, what do we read? And um, uh, we need to leverage on some of these abilities um, and getting this, um, the intellectual property, because if you take a simple uh, startup, Waze, um, which is in Israel, uh, I remember Israel one because we sold one of our IPs um, transfer happened about 3.1 million at that point uh, uh, with Slintech and at the same time read the news item about 3.1 billion which was his transport app uh, by ways in Israel small startup yeah it's US dollar billion whereas we were on US million 3.1 right see the order of magnitude that's a potential of couple of people putting their uh, thinking right doing the design coming up with something and also protecting it so uh, Innovation is supported really when you have a solid IP environment also. Uh, FDIs are benefited by Sri Lanka communicating that we have a very good, strong, protective mechanism uh, for IP. I think FDIs depend on a solid, good, uh, what I would call valuable FDIs. Look at what is the, how the, uh, uh, the IP environment in the country, right? Uh, whether your stuff that are coming in is very easily can get lost or get copied, then you don't really like to put things here. So there is an uh, project that are happening, but I suppose the much more important is the private sector and the businesses to look at this aspect of uh, intellectual property. And you don't have to create it within yourself. You can buy, you can leverage on purchasing, right? The technology transfers and look at the royalty models and see um, whether the, our, our fabrication or the ability to manufacture something and put some creative content in and then upgrading that. Um, there are a host of opportunities I think uh, Sri Lanka should be looking at from IP. Uh, there's a program going and I don't think we should be worried about um, the current, the perception is in my view is not quite right, but we need to correct it because perception matters at the end of the day. So uh, that is the ongoing program in getting people to move into this arena uh, and, um, and to project a strong image in IP. Thank you. I think that answers that question quite well. Uh, Linda, there's one for you. Uh, Linda, as a successful entrepreneur, uh, do you bother about bilateral agreements between countries? Questioning because you are able to get success on your own merits, and that too in a very highly competitive market like India. Yes, uh, actually, it's very much, uh, it's, it's really important. For example, we are really planning to leverage the Indian FTA uh, in a big way. So uh, whatever, uh, I mean, as an entrepreneur, I think especially, 
you have to tune into your uh, national framework or what's happening in your country if you're really to uh, kind of uh, be part of that whole uh, system. So bilateral agreements, uh, I mean, where t you, you need to be tuned to everything. So uh, it's not really on your own. Uh, I mean, as an entrepreneur, you've got to leverage everybody, right? Because you just got a vision in your head and to mobilize that uh, from the government to industries to uh, you know, your own teams to all of that have to be behind you. So uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure why bilateral agreements were taken as an example, but certainly bilateral agreements and everything you can leverage as an entrepreneur, you'll go for. Uh, and right now to get into India, uh, we are just going to full on uh, leverage that more in the future to come. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Samantha, I would like to direct a question that has come for about tea to you. Maybe you can talk about tea. Um, do we want to invest capital and adopt technology and take this industry forward? That's the first question. And if yes, what's the strategy? Should we replace tea with some other productive commodity moving on? I think it's a related industry maybe. <laughs> We should have been a better person to answer, but I think we, we are having, uh, it's an industry which is challenged more due to external, external factors than internal factors. Uh, I think there is, a, there is uh, uh, because the fact that the agriculture, we are not having this uh, optimal agricultural conditions, uh, that there are shortage of weedicides, uh, the extra en environment which is, which is created around tea uh, has has had has had an impact, so I think the operating model that we have uh, will be challenged to sustain it, and I think we will have to look at some other models because with the cost of labor going up, the cost of labor component in the cost of production going to astronomical promotions, uh, and the, I think the machinery and the technology being fairly archaic and. The, with new technology, uh, investment in a new technology being difficult in the current circumstances, I think all points to a situation where it may not be sustainable to run these scale of plantations. I think that's, that's my view. I think if we are going to look at alternative crops, I, I think we have to be looking at again with a very keen eye on the, of the, on the environment because one of the key factors that we are at high elevations today, even we are getting away with the current uh, situation is because we have some green coverage which is at, uh, at over, over three to 4,000 feet. So I think that if we go into other crops where it makes the soil more bare, I think we will face a much bigger environmental problem. So an alternative crop which can go here uh, has to be again something which has to be looked into taking into account the fact that preservation of the environment is a key factor of the development of this country because sustainability is something which is very, very needed for the tourism and other, other factors which uh, govern the economy. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for you, Major General. I'm sorry, I'm calling you Major General because I'm finding it difficult to pronounce your name. Uh, but <laughs> Munir, sorry, yes, Munir. Uh, now, this question is um, dialogue launch e, e to easy cash, the mobile money, same as B cash, platform few years ago, I think it's about three years ago. Uh, uh, but doubt th that the product really succeeded or gathered the expected momentum now, since dialogue is not here, it's not fair to say whether it did not gather or not. So I will sort of rephrase the question uh, How long do you think it takes in mobile money? to sort of get off moment, into momentum and, and take it forward at a, at a space that, you know, it really means something. And also, does the fact that Sri Lanka has a quite well-developed banking system, will it sort of be a negative for the fact that uh, mobile money would be slow to take off? You know, a factor that will not prevent mobile money taking off yet. Well, uh, it is important. Uh, first of all, there must be a clear need for MFS. Uh, in our country, uh, for the domestic remittance, this particular means was very useful. Like, uh, we have certain 
hubs where people actually come to get employment. The factories and industries, primarily the government industries, are located close to the cities for various reasons. Now the workers who work in these factories all come from the village. I've talked about the rickshaw pullers. Likewise, many people actually come to the cities and surrounding places of cities to seek job. Now they leave behind their families back home in the villages and suburban areas. Now at the end of the month, obviously as they get their salary or when they have a regular income and they need to send the money for the subsistence of their family, they need to have a means. Now that is to be done through somebody going home after about a month and everybody would give the money to that individual. Now you are living completely onto the personal attitude of that person. He could carry 20,000 taka or 20,000 Sri Lankan rupees give 15,000 and say that I have used 5,000 for my very serious urgent need, I'll give it back after one month. And that may not happen at all. And that 5,000 rupees is very precious to a garment worker or a rickshaw puller. Now, when we had this particular need in place, MFS gave the solution. Now, one opening an account back home and the worker having his or her account where she or he is there at the workplace. Now they can transfer that money in 90 seconds. And it's not going to go anywhere. It's going to land in that particular account where it is sent. That much is the level of security. Now the other thing was trust. That has to be very trustworthy. This is where our people have issues, obviously, because they earn very little, they send very little, they rely and survive on that little money that they earn. So the trust earning was one thing that we could do very well. That our money or their money that we deal never got lost. Because even if you lose your mobile phone, the money is not in the mobile phone, it's in the system. So anybody having to know his or her PIN can get the SIM back and use that pin to actually retrieve the money. So trust was another very important thing. And obviously now, when we are looking at the foreign remittance, they also send it to the bank. And bank, as I mentioned, doesn't have the number of branches in the villages. They want the money to reach his old father, or his wife, or anybody that is depending on that earning. So, the last mile solution is provided by us. The bank would settle the money in the Nostra account. The bank will instruct mobile finance service like us that you send this money to X, Y, Z in the village. And we exactly do that. We are trying for this with our central bank being our regulator to allow that partnership. And central bank is now looking at this seriously because we have a serious depletion of our foreign currency earning because of the informal hundi that's taking place. They're using the platform, avoiding the national exchequer to actually accrue the value. So the money is kept there in the Middle East or Malaysia or Singapore. The recipient is also getting the value appropriately, only that in the loop, the national exchequer is taken out. So we are replicating the same model by telling our gov regulator that allow us to do the same. You have to bid them in the same game. Otherwise, obviously, the depletion is going to have a tremendous bad impact. So it takes time, the right kind of investment, right kind of people to be brought into the company who can really contribute. And it would take at least four years to get the right kind of traction. You have to make people aware as to what this is, how it benefits, and then only they believe in it and start using it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Professor. Uh, we've been looking at some of the success factors, and I think uh, Major General Munir is very right 
it's the need. We don't have the kind of uh, migrant worker phenomenon, domestic migrant worker phenomenon that they have in, in uh, Bangladesh. And ours is a compact country. And the other thing, of course, is the existing methods, you know, the money orders and the postal orders are more or less effective. So we expected this not to be very much uh, uh, an issue in Sri Lanka, that it would be an issue in other countries in our research. However, I got to say that uh, everywhere I go, people are very impressed by the fact that Sri Lanka has been an innovator uh, in three mobile companies working together with mobile financial services. Whereas in places like Kenya, where, where it has been used as a, as a means of sort of competitive advantage for one company, while here we have three companies that have been uh, collaborating on mobile money and that is seen as a major innovation in the uh, mobile financial services sector. Yeah, and I think uh, our society, uh, while our banking is quite good and as you said the need is much less, uh, society is moving ca to cashless. And as we move to cashless and I believe that more than credit cards, this is what will be the tool that will, you know, future replace. Uh, so it will take some time but it will fly. And, and it's, it's a med more medium game term product than a short term product. Yeah, we have about 10 minutes more and uh, there's uh, another question that I like to put uh, to maybe the both professors here. Um, is there a clear strategy to collaborate those government research institutes, the, collaborate the government research institutes with private sector? If so, there are any success cases? I suppose you must have a little bit of disagreement in one of these panels. So, you know, I, I believe that uh, if you really think of the original model, right, every kilogram of tea that goes out of the country, they collect what is called a cess. And that was supposed to fund the Tea Research Institute and so on, right? But when you actually look at the, the workings of the Tea Research Institute, you look at the workings of the Rubber Research Institute, you find that quite a lot of it has moved down at the, at the village level. What they see is more like enforcement rather than real research flow through and get, helping the smallholders. Particularly, we've talked to rubber smallholders and tea smallholders in our research and they really don't see this, this research coming down to, 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 to them. So my sense is that, yes, we need to fix it, but you know, proliferation of government research institutes and the throwing of government R&D money isn't the solution. I think you need to go back and look at the Palmyra Research Institute and various kinds of research institutes that I have visited and see what is actually the outcome. What are they producing other than jobs? That's, I think, the question. So I think we need to rethink that and to a certain extent the whole idea of you know, creating new institutions, providing R&D, uh, uh, tax breaks, and so on, is, was an admission that the old uh, colonial model of, you know, funding uh, tea research institute and rubber research institute and so on, using cessors, was not working. That we need some novel solution. So that's why I was saying, okay, fix the supply side of the, the activity, but also look at the demand side. Let's look at where these research innovations actually come and impact at the market level. I'm going beyond getting it to the smallholders. I'm saying let's look at how it impacts, how it, these things can re result in marketable new products. So I'm not that, I mean, I think it could be done, but I think it's a, it's a very hard road to, to, to go on. On the other hand, I think the universities, we have a possibility that universities, not only universities, but all higher educational institutions, let's bring the whole internships, work experience issue into the, into the center of the conversation. And there, I think, the private sector, sometimes when I talk to the universities, they say, we don't have enough support from the pri private sector. You do, they don't give us enough internship places. I know it takes effort and, and resources to, to really support a student. But I think we need to do more of that. I think that's where Moritua, in my opinion, has been a pioneer. And I think we need to take that model and see how we can extend it uh, throughout the, the higher education, tertiary educational system, not just the universities. Ajit. 
first I will do some defending and then I'll go to the offensive. Um, <laughs> that is the, um, how many of us may know that what, if you talk about the BG varieties and Sri Lankans, we are having uh, the rice varieties that uh, have given us uh, Green Revolution at some point, being the result of our research institute, the Paddy Research Institute, the Rice Research Institute, Paddy Research Institute. Right, uh, because we are given this BG, we forget that it's Batalagode and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are so, uh, there are tangible uh, uh, stuff that have come out of research institute. Yes, that's the old colonial model uh, for putting up the special with the tea, uh, tea, coconut, and rubber, rubber. But the point is, research institutes have done, but they have been really, really hampered by the input. And of course, Sri Lanka, from intellectual property rights time, we do not have. We need a modification. Plan breeder rights are not recognized in Sri Lanka. So because plant breeder rights are not recognized, some of that effort, I mean, plant breeding, this is not an easy, easy, it takes a uh, long time. And uh, then people move away from that. Now we really lack breeders. Uh, in Sri Lanka, we, people do not study, people do not try to be in this area, which are very important because uh, even if you take the Global Innovation Index, the idea is how innovation can uh, is going to help feed the billions. We're talking about nine billion in, uh, 10, 30, 20 more years, and we need to innovate on how do we feed, because agricultural model has to change. It has to be by technology. Unless we absorb or uh, embrace technology, we are going to face a big problem. So institutions, yes, they have delivered, but they need to be revamped, they need to be supported, and one area that the government did was probably the double taxation and then moving on to triple taxation benefit and also for advanced technology you were giving um, accelerated depreciation uh, we found we find that none of these uh, instruments were really uh, were handled well uh, and probably the new inland revenue act has taken out the taxation thing which we believe is not quite right it should be there the fact that it didn't deliver at that it was not the problem of the instrument is the problem of the execution of the instrument. And uh, when you look at a case of like Canada or Singapore, we see an ease of, uh, ease of doing business. In ease of doing business, you can do this R&D, use of this taxation benefit, how to submit to your assessor and get it done. Now, at the moment, what we found was people who have engaged in that, you meet different assessors in different environment, uh, you get two different, three different results, and that led to the failure of the taxation system. And I think that need to be looked at rather than abolish the, uh, the taxation, so that was one thing, but we can do something like innovation vouchers. I think something UK has done and some other countries have done, uh, innovation vouchers can help more the SME sector, where you give an outright, uh, you have a problem, you come out, this is the amount of money, you go and reach this place, this place has the expertise, you get it resolved. And I think we need to move into this type of area where we can really quickly solve some of the things and gain trust and improve on. There's whole amount of infrastructure and ability, uh, specifically at the university sector, and private research institutes are now, private research is now coming up very well, um, need to leverage here. All right, thank you. I think we have almost run out of time, but I got two minutes, and uh, well, it's extremely difficult to summarize uh, all what we discussed because, uh, okay, I have five minutes. The lady in front says I have five minutes, so I have one more question. Actually. Let's try to summarize that with that because uh, we, were, we had a, quite a diverse uh, discussion here and, and it's very really difficult to summarize all that points in, in a very short time. Uh, this last question I want to put here is that, you know, it sort of accuses that we Sri Lankans, you know, sit and discuss uh, talks and numbers and figures, which is very interesting. But uh, it says, can we organize, maybe it says a mega workshop but whatever, to put an action plan. Uh, with timelines, so that actually we go somewhere. I think uh, all I would like everybody to say something about it, uh, as in summary. But uh, I know you've been uh, and Costi. You know, one of the things that has been happening is that uh, you know Professor Samrachi was actively involved. His presentation was part of something like that. But do we really have, as a country, an action plan uh, with responsibilities and timelines uh, that will really take us? Uh, to, to this uh, bliss situation where we really start innovating using this technology uh, in making the economy grow better and, and into production. Anybody want to take the lead? Yeah. Yeah, I think if you uh, start uh, measuring, I think it all comes down to measuring, isn't it? I mean, uh, 
for example, if you start measuring by the impact you're creating, uh, now I guess in our sector, we are, we are meant to deliver commercial results. You're working private sector with private sector. Uh, and for example, the apparel industry has a five-year strategic plan and they've got a new one as well. Uh, but uh, I mean, so, so that actually there is there, but the government side, uh, just coming in from the private sector, I mean, we do obviously see a gap, I think, and that question does have some validity and some room for improvement would be my point there. Yeah, and even uh, with the IT sector, the SASCOM targets and et cetera, I mean, is there well, I, mean, a, I, I can give you a, a, my broader general comment. So, I mean, clearly, clearly execution is a problem um, or a point in general in the state sector. In particular, execution is a problem. And where, in a very general sense, where you see that typically that's because of a couple of things. As Linda pointed out, visibility and measurement is a problem. So we don't necessarily have, even if we do have a plan, I don't really see any visibility about progress, about broadcasting where we are, what the metrics are, what the KPIs are. Um, I don't really, from my personal view, I don't really see a lot of, of accountability. So who individually is responsible for delivering a plan? Uh, and what are the consequences of not delivering a plan? I and mean, that's in the private sector. We all know how that works. Uh, you don't really see a lot of that in the state sector. So having a workshop to come up with a plan, great. But that's not really the problem. The problem is, as we all know, is executing on that plan. Yeah, what I would like to, uh, I mean, obviously, if you can have a full-fledged plan with uh, timetables and so on and so forth, it'll be wonderful. But what I would think of is, if we can have some success stories, what has been achieved in terms of actual innovation, right? Uh, stories that can be told, what I said is as facts on the ground. And then, you know, what can we use it to bring particular kinds of invest investment into this country? Not investment for more real estate, for God's sake, right? These are non-tradable sectors. Not more real estate, but investment for innovation, innovation-centric companies that will develop new products and will reach out into the region. If we can target that, and Dumindra, I'm prioritizing it because we have hope that the BOI will, will take a lead in this, right? So if we can prioritize that and we can have a timetable for that, I think that would be something that I would be very, very happy to support. We are outside the government. The government has to take the leads. I mean, I can, what's the point of us coming up with timetables? The government has to take the, the timetables and assign responsibilities. I would say, we're not talking about money. Assign responsibilities to different actors, including the private sector. Assign responsibility to the chamber. They all talk and they all ask things from the government. Tell them something they should do. Well, uh, even though the question was what can be done at the national level, I'd like to bring it down to what we do in Bikash. Uh, and out of six years, I'm associated for four years with Bikash. We really sit and evaluate almost regularly as to what needs to be done. And we arrive at an action plan, obviously with a timeline. And we target that. We definitely make people responsible and accountable for doing a particular thing, uh, be it market penetration, be it analyzing, be it data kind of uh, uh, collection, and put in place everything that can be done to execute. We tend to say that ideas are 5%. Execution is 95%. Thank you. You just, uh, I think the fact that this is a chamber event and uh, commenting as the former chairman of the chamber, uh, if we take this event that we have, every year, every session, uh, the takeaway, key takeaways is summarized and sun sent to by the secretariat within two months to the subject ministry, uh, giving in highlighted form what was discussed, who discussed, and what are the outcomes. So I think we have, from a chamber point of view, I think we have been continuously doing it and it's in to engage the government and the decision makers on, on this one. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a battle that we have to keep continuing uh, and, and uh, we have been doing so and I'm sure that's something we will do so in the future as well. 
quick comment, I'm not really in favor of a major workshop again and um, another action plan because if you read what has been written, and I think Samantha made a point about translating what's coming out to the key ministries, it just acting on as much as possible together on some of the things that we know as deficient and addressing them up front quickly to build up confidence. We need to build up confidence in our system. And it's, I think, collectively there should be need to address some of those problems. I'll just, one example we know we have tackled, try to tackle, it's what we call the green channel for researchers. In Sri Lanka, a key differentiator is, even if it takes from Singapore, if a person wants uh, something uh, to do, and we do not manufacture a lot of things in Sri Lanka, uh, but even in Singapore, you get it in 48 hours max. In Sri Lanka, it takes six months, right? And eliminate that inconsistency, and you are achieving a huge step forward. So likewise, we can identify 10 or 15 key things that need to change, to transform this system from the barriers that we face, get the list and attack them up front. Um, that's the key necessity at this stage because time is of the essence, technology is changing, robots may take over, artificial intelligence is going to beat the natural intelligence, 2030 is an year of singularity. We really need to understand what's going to happen and take stock of it and move fast. Thank you, Ajit, then okay, we all can stay home and play games. So uh, thank you, panel. Thank you very much, Linda and, and the gentleman here. Uh, and uh, also thank you very much for the questions that you sent us across. Uh, so uh, I think we'll close now. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a gentle reminder to please fill out the audience polling questionnaire on your tables. If you haven't filled out the questionnaire for the previous sessions, you can still do so now and hand them over to the Secretariat desk at the entrance. Ladies and gentlemen, that draws a close to the first day of the Sri Lanka Economic Summit. Today would not have been possible if not for your presence and patronage. We hope you had an enlightening and thought-provoking day. Kindly make your way to the foyer for, re for refreshments and the networking session. Thank you and good night.